Vestibular disease is one of the most common presentations in veterinary practice of a neurological patient. And your neurological exam skills are really important here to be able to localize the problem. And so in this video, I'm going to take you through the neurological exam findings in a case that presented with acute onset, head tilt and drooling. So this sweet girl was presented age four with a two day history that had started on day one with sudden onset, left sided tearing. They noticed a lot of, um, of wet underneath her eyes, which we call euphoria. Uh, she also had much reddening of the white of her eye. And on day two, they noticed that her head was tilted to the left. She was dribbling saliva and dropping food from the left side of her mouth. And she had some abnormal eye movements and she was leaning to the left. And so we're going to go through the neurological examination in, in this little dog. And the aim of the neurological examination is really to do two things. The first is to localize the lesion and then use that localization to give you a differential diagnosis, i.e. what could be the cause of it, and also to help with prognostication. So when we're doing a neurological examination, it's easiest if we go through a check sheet such as this one. And that helps you do it in a logical order. So you can see here that we have things like mental status, posture and gait. And that's usually what we start with. We often then go to the cranial nerves. And this is the list of all of the tests that you can do on the cranial nerves. Again, if you have a checklist and it makes it much easier for you. And then we do our postural reactions. We can also do spinal reflexes, but these are used to localize a problem to the region of the spinal cord or the neuromuscular system and aren't necessary in this particular case. And then after all of that, we can localize it to a certain area. So looking at the gate here. The first thing to observe is, is the dog bright and interactive, interested in her surroundings? She does look quite anxious, but she is aware, checking on uh, me, the walker, uh, paying an interest in her surroundings. She is slightly ataxic. Notice that wide base stance there. And obviously she has her head tilt, which is going over to the left. Now we're circling her. And she's struggling with that. Notice the wide base stance. She's not able to cross her legs as so she's circling. And we're going in a clockwise to the right direction. Now we try to left up. Going to the left is much more problematic. And again, she, she struggles with that. So this gait is characteristic for a vestibular ataxia. We have three types of ataxia, cerebellar, proprioceptive, and vestibular. And this is a vestibular ataxia, which reflects dysfunction of those reflex pathways that maintain the eye, head and body position, because we always want to keep everything central and balanced. So we need to keep our head central, our eye central and our body position central. And vestibular ataxia is what and vestibular disease is what happens when there is dysfunction of that. So you tend to lean over to one side, you have your head tilted to one side and your eyes will deviate to uh, one side. The other reflections of that is that um, you may need to have additional support when you're doing more complicated activities. So this is an example of a dog with mild vestibular disease that was using the stairs to increase that sensory input of which way was up uh, when he was doing a more complex lo um, uh, locomotion. Where we circled this little girl, we found that she was uh, less able to go to the side that she has the problem on the left and so she tended to uh, fall and stumble. We can see that lateralization is leaning to the side of the problem and this wide based stance. So what is the vestibular system? So it's a, a system uh, that involves the ears, the nerve and the brainstem and also the cerebellum. 
So the ears, you can think of them as a bit like a gyroscope in your head with these semicircular canals lined by hair, lumps of chalk in them. Wherever those chalk stimulate the hairs, wherever your head is in space, and that gives you a kind of 3D grid reference of where you are in space. And that information goes down the vestibular nerve. And of course, you have both sides. That information is coordinated into the brainstem and uh, also influenced by the cerebellum. If you take away one side, then you have quite literally an imbalance. You have information coming from one side and not from the other side. And so the simple way to think of it is it tends to push you towards the, the side that's got a problem. And the most important thing to do when assessing a dog with a vestibular problem is to try to tell the difference between having a peripheral problem, i.e. ears or nerves, or a central problem. And that's really what we're going to focus on in this discussion. So the first thing that we notice about this dog is that she has a head tilt to the left and she also has a spontaneous nystagmus with the fast phase going away from the side of the vestibular lesion on the left so the fast phase is going to the right so you see that jerk to the right uh, which is horizontal possibly slightly rotatory with her. She has an all abnormal ocular vestibular or ocular cephalic reflex and she also has a vestibular strabismus and this is most apparent that when we alter her position such as lifting her head as we're doing here um, we can see that the eye deviates down and that's um, not a permanent vestibulus strabismus which we'd see with an ocular motor lesion but something that is positional, which is very characteristic of a vestibular problem, and it occurs on the same side as the vestibular lesion. We also see eyebrow movements in this dog, which is uh, characteristic of the, the dog's anatomy. Uh, we've selected for having more expressive eyebrows, and this is a reflex that occurs because of a connection between the vestibular apparatus and the facial nerve. So we are looking at the rest of the cranial nerves in this dog and we start with a menace response. Now this is quite important here. Do you just see that little third eyelid flick? That is very characteristic of this dog's problem. Now we're doing facial sensation. Compare this to the other side. Now as you see she's not blinking her eye but is that because of a sensory deficit or a motor deficit? When we tickle her nose here, which really is not very pleasant, we can see that she's withdrawing, suggesting that she is feeling that. We can also tickle down her ear, but that has sensation for the facial nerve as well. I'm very lightly pressing her lip there. And again, we can see there's no movement of that lip. She's not particularly impressed with me doing that. Lightly tickling here, we can see that contraction of her lip very normally on the right side. Now we're doing a gag. She's got normal jaw tones, quite difficult to open her mouth, normal looking tongue, and she has a normal gag. I'm just showing you there how baggy that uh, lip is. We can see some drool coming out of that and increased tearing from the eyes, whereas that is a more normal lip for a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So all of these deficits are very characteristic for a left-sided facial nerve paralysis in this dog. She's unable to close her eye, but she can feel it. In fact, her eyes are very red, and I suspect that she may have some dry eye because the facial nerve is also giving uh, a parasympathetic supply to the lacrimal gland that can be affected in this particular disease. She's unable to move her lips. She's dribbling food. Um, and dribbling saliva and there's also an excess of tearing coming from her eyes because of the abnormal conformation of her eyelids because they have reduced tone and it means that she isn't draining through her nasal lacrimal duct as much. Uh, her sensation to her face however is normal and it's very important to distinguish this from a trigeminal lesion. So in this dog, we've identified that she has a vestibular problem and she also on the same size has a facial nerve problem. So the most important next step is to determine whether this is a central problem, i.e. in the brain, 
versus a peripheral problem, i.e. the vestibular nerve or facial nerve, which are run together um, and they're at the very start of when they leave the skull, they're enclosed by a common sheath of dura um, or a inner ear problem or a middle ear problem because the facial nerve is also traveling in the facial canal in the inner middle ear region. This obviously has a very important from the dog's prognosis, having a problem with the brain is so much more serious than having a problem with the nerve versus the ear. So the most important tests and assessments for determining whether a dog has central versus peripheral vestibular or facial nerve disease is mental status and the postural reactions. Now, when they are affected by acute vestibular disease, then they're not going to be very bright and happy um, qu quite simply because vestibular disease results in a lot of nausea. So sometimes that can be very difficult to assess. So uh, we take a lot of stock by our postural reactions. Saying that, though, when you can't balance properly, postural reactions can also be difficult to assess. And if you're presented with a dog which is just rolling, unable to stand up, then it can be better to let them settle, let them, you know, make them a, a comfortable um, uh, bed in a cage, let them settle for a couple of hours so that they can quite literally work out which way is up and then assess them again. So when we start to look at postural reactions, then the first test I usually do is conscious proprioception. Now, if you can see how I am supporting the weight absolutely completely, if you assess proprioception by pulling a piece of paper out from under a foot, you're not assessing proprioception. That's a very useless test for that particular disease. Can if you can imagine if you have a balance disorder and um, you're standing on a piece of paper and I pull it out. Well, of course, you're going to be delayed picking up your uh, feet because you have a balance disorder and that has nothing to do with proprioception. So in this, I'm completely supporting her weight and turning over a paw and she won't actually let me do it because she has normal proprioception. Sometimes this can be uh, somewhat difficult to, uh, to assess. So we always do more than one test. So this is hemi walking here. It's a little bit more difficult if you have vestibular disease because you're already not feeling very stable but we're looking for rapid correction of the feet and no knuckling. And likewise on the other side, again, we need to su completely support this dog's weight so that she doesn't feel like she's going to fall over. And then we use hopping. So when the shoulder or the hip is no longer in alignment with the rest of the joints, when you push them over, Again, supporting all of their weight, they should rapidly correct. So we're uh, doing the forelimbs first, and you can see that rapid correction. And the other forelimb, and this is probably the most useful test to do in a dog with vestibular disease, because especially a small dog, you can completely support all of their weight and they can feel less uh, unstable. So with our pelvic limbs, and you're comparing one side with the other. So, the neurological exam findings would suggest that with the exception of having a left-sided facial nerve problem and vestibular problem, the neurological examination is completely normal. And this would give this dog a peripheral problem, i.e. not brain disease, but disease of the vestibular nerve or, and facial nerve, or possibly a problem with the inner ear apparatus and the facial nerve, which is uh, quite close to each other, as we saw in the previous MRI. She's a middle-aged Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, um, and there are no other signs apart from the fact that she has been uh, managed for presumed Chiari pain since she was a young dog. And you have to bear in mind in, in this breed, there are often multiple comorbidities that are not uh, actually related to each other. So what is our differential diagnosis? Bearing in mind the facial nerve paralysis in the first place, um, the, so certainly because the science certainly started with a facial nerve problem, the most common differential, especially in this particular breed, is idiopathic, which we're going to discuss in the next slide.
We could have an otitis media, so an infection in the middle ear here. This is spreading to the area of the facial nerve. Hypothyroidism, possibility, but this is really an overstated prevalence. Um, neoplastic uh, neoplasia in this region is really very, very rare. And so really are non-neoplastic masses such as a cholesteoma. These tend to be in dogs that have had a very chronic ear infection. So based on signalment, i.e. the breed, the age, this is most likely to be idiopathic facial nerve paralysis. And that because we see it more commonly in certain breeds, especially middle-aged uh, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, Boxers and, and Spaniels of all breeds, suggesting there's probably a genetic factor. And in those breeds, you often have associated vestibular signs in the acute phase. And, and I believe this is because these nerves share a dural sheaf, so they're tight within this uh, packaging, which is the dura or the meninges, and that's going through a small hole. And I believe that when the facial nerve swells because of the problem with the facial nerve, uh, and it's inflamed, uh, it starts to affect the vestibular nerve. So what other investigations would we do where we would want to do an otoscopic ex examination for signs of otitis media and externa? But if this dog doesn't have a history of that, then it's really unlikely that it would spontaneously develop a middle ear infection, inner ear infection, without having signs of it being in the outer ear. We did a Shermer tear test in this dog and perhaps surprisingly, given the red eye, this was uh, normal. Um, we can monitor her, her neurological examination. And this is by far the most cheapest and most efficient test that you can do. And if that neurological examination remains stable, then idiopathic disease is, uh, is likely. And especially the, uh, we would expect in this instance that the vestibular signs would improve over a few days. And some caregivers are going to opt for an MRI scan, especially if um, uh, the, you have more complicated history and it was normal in this case. So how do we manage her? Well uh, for the idiopathic vestibular syndrome uh, we can give um, mo mainly supportive care so if they're nauseous then we need to maintain their hydration. Um, for nausea Odansetron works better than the other ones that we uh, we can use such as meropotent or metoclopramide and that's because they're effective against um, nausea rather than vomiting. Uh, we may need to employ physiotherapy or physical therapy. Sometimes it's pretty basic stuff like uh, as I've said in the previous um, slide the dogs need to increase their sensory input on the side that is damaged so they will need to have a wall next to them going up the stairs or perhaps your leg so sometimes just how you help these dogs makes a huge difference um, so putting them in a harness and giving them support on their side that they're falling to is very important if an animal has visual deficits then their recovery will be delayed because animals recover from this often by compensation, which means that they need their sight present to be able to quite literally see the horizon and, uh, and recalibrate. Uh, some people will use propentophylline. Theoretically, it may be useful, but this is very unproven. And beta histine is what's used in humans, but there's no high quality evidence of, inf uh, of effectiveness. For the facial nerve paralysis, we need to make sure that they have ocular lubrication because they have increased exposure because of failure to close the eyelid. We need to make sure that their oral care is good because they have more danger of getting food caught around their, um, uh, uh, their teeth, especially if they have very, very floppy lips. Um, and drooling may cause a wet eczema, especially in these uh, dogs with much longer um, fur. And prognosis is good, but the facial function may take years to return or perhaps not at all, in which case they may be left with a, a, a contracted face. So overall, for this little girl, the prognosis is good, but she may be left with, with facial nerve deficits for a long time.